Hello and welcome to tonight's event from the British Library in partnership with Penguin Live. I'm Brett Walsh from the Cultural Events Department and I'm delighted to welcome you to this event which is part of our nature season, a season of events on nature and the environment. Now tonight's discussion is between Ray Mears and Selena Scott and Ray is going to be talking about his new book which you can buy using the button just above the video. Towards the end of the event, we'll also be taking questions. So if you'd like to submit a question, please do so using the form just below the video here. This discussion is going to be chaired by the fantastic Selena Scott. Selena is a journalist and broadcaster and was one of the first anchor women on UK television. In the 1980s, her reports on the Kenyan ivory trade led to an international ban. Selena still broadcasts regularly and is currently rewilding her farm in Yorkshire. So, without further ado, I'll hand over to Selena and Ray. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and, uh, and welcome to this uh, wonderful chat we're about to have with a man who um, has been something of a hero of mine now for many years. I've always felt that if I ever got stuck in the wilderness, the person that I would want by my side is Ray Mears. He's, um, his knowledge of nature, his knowledge of wildlife is understated uh, and yet uh, almost exhausted. You know, it's, it's, uh, he, he's, he's been everywhere, it seems. He's, he's put himself at the very edge of everything. And I'm delighted that he's joining us tonight to talk about his new book. It's called We Are Nature. And uh, he's there. Hello, Ray. Good evening, Selena. Very nice to meet you. Yes, <laughs> well, congratulations I, uh, for all the work you did for, for, I, for elephants and ivory. I think well, that's, that's, you know, people forget, but it was really important and groundbreaking. Well, well let's, let's, let's start on that, uh, because in your book, you uh, have a photograph of a rhinoceros, a carcass lying there, having had its horn taken. And, uh, and I, I went, yes, I went to Cora to meet George Adamson uh, and filmed the, I, the, the poachers and, uh, and we, we caught up with them. And eventually George Adamson was killed by the poachers trying to protect the elephants. But uh, George Adamson was the kind of man uh, who was very similar, is very similar, was very similar to you, that he seemed to have no fear whatsoever. Um, and before, before we talk about this, let me just show everyone a, a photograph in your book. Um, if I put it up here, perhaps you can see it. This one here of Ray. Now he's sitting in a canoe and look at his posture. He's got his legs in front and he's leaning forward. It's almost like he's sitting on a beach eating an ice cream, but look at what he's watching. You tell everyone what you're watching, Ray. Well, uh, that's a five meter crocodile saltwater crocodile, and in its mouth it's got, I think it was a 350 kilo or thereabouts um, dead pig, wild pig, which it's trying to um, take away into the shadows to eat, and I'm in the way. And uh, believe it or not, that, that crocodile made a, a pretty good attempt at submerging with that pig. Um, but having failed to do so, it then hissed at me with the greatest menace that I've ever, ever, ever felt from any creature on the planet. It was quite something. Amazing animals. And yet, you showed no fear. And I know you were asked this question a lot, but why, why are, you, are you not frightened of these animals? Um, I think fear is a process of anticipation. I think if, you know, if you're about to jump out of an aircraft, you can think of all the things that can go wrong. When you're dealing with wildlife, things happen quickly, so quickly, you don't have time to think about them. So you respond to what's going on. But... I think also, hopefully, you've done your homework and you, you have an understanding of the parameters so that you can behave accordingly. And um, that's the secret, really, is to focus on what you know and not to think about what might be. And that moment, I think a lot of people can understand it. That moment when you're confronted by something, you don't automatically often feel fear. But it's afterwards, and it's that afterwards that I'm interested in with you. You, you, you've obviously can control it in a way um, that other people can't. I mean, I, I remember George Adamson 
walked out of his compound uh, with meat to feed the lions. <laughs> and he, he walked out and these big beasts came running towards him. And I thought, I, this, they're, going to get, they're going to eat him. They were wild lions. And, and he threw them the meat and he had no fear whatsoever. And he did it every night. And but you, I, in a way, exhibit the same kind of, of uh, courage in that sense. Maybe, I'm not sure. He, I think that was his skill though, Selena. If, if for one moment he had hesitated or shown any sort of doubt, then the, the lions would have perceived him differently and then he would have been in mortal danger. So his confidence is, is a, a degree of bravado perhaps, but it, it is a very fine line between a, a, a weakness that the lions will not tolerate and a strength that they fear or respect. So to come back to this, this idea of you confronting these animals, coming up against them unexpectedly in the bush, and then going back out there again the next day, the, 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 the control of your emotions, is it something that you were born with or is it something that you had to learn? I think, you're, I think you're born with it. Maybe I'm too stupid to feel fear. I don't know. But um, I have to say, though, with a crocodile, is very different to a lion. A, a lion, there, there, there's a dialogue that goes on when, when you confront a, a lion in terms of body language and posture. A crocodile pays no heed to that. It's, it's simply, can I snatch you or not? And um, they're two very different animals. When you say there's a dialogue with a lion, tell me what you say to a lion or what you, you hear from a lion. Well, there, there, there's a body language going on. Um, it's not natural for humans and lions to come into conflict with each other. So we, we would rather stay apart and, and maintain some distance. And a lion may be unhappy that we have, it, have, have come too close to it, just as you might if someone stood too close to you on the underground. And a lion will, will behave uh, to provide, I mean, in most cases, will provide some warning and some indication of that. And as long as we pay respect to each other, um, then, then we can have these encounters and walk away safely. On a, on a, and on a daily basis, there are safari guides exploiting that dialogue to bring their, uh, their guests into close proximity to animals for a thrilling experience without coming to any harm. Um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't begin to attempt to do that with a saltwater crocodile. Uh, they have a much smaller brain. They think in a completely different way. They're totally reptilian and uh, you'd be in, in, in very, very great danger. You have, you have I know, a plaster cast of a footprint. Would you like to show everyone? You got it. This is uh, uh, the, 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 a cast of, a, of an alpha male wolf uh, that I cast in Idaho. Um, and you can see, if I put my hand beside it, how, how large that is. It's, uh, it's a special thing. This in many ways was the inspiration for the book I've written when I was thinking about what to write. Um, this to me symbolizes a species that um, we, we, now know, we, we now fear and don't understand. And when I made the documentary uh, about the wolves in Idaho, I filmed um, with the Nez Perce people, you know, a First Nation tribe in North America. And a lot of what we filmed didn't make it into the documentary, sadly. It, was, it found its way onto the cutting room floor, which I was really upset about. But one of the things that they told me is that for thousands of years, they lived alongside wolves, directly competing with wolves for their food. So they were a threat to their well-being, but they didn't hate the wolf and they didn't fear the wolf. They respected it as a great hunter. They wished to be as good as the wolf at hunting and they saw it as a brother. And there's such wisdom in that attitude. And yet when I was making the documentary, I found a local population with a medieval hatred of the wolf. Um, and really what I would like is for people to take a little bit of time to make their own opinions up about wildlife, to uh, learn how to see things more clearly, to take a moment to park their fear to one side and to understand what's going on in relationships with wildlife and, and just look and see. Because the moment you do that, you discover that these things aren't quite as, uh, as, we, as we like to demonize them. They're much more interesting and much more important. Um, 
and they're, they're fellow creatures that we share our planet with and, uh, and our lifetimes with. This plaster cast was taken by you uh, uh, and you were in Idaho and you went to sleep. In your book, you tell uh, this wonderful story of going to sleep on a hillside and waking up and looking directly at the alpha male wolf uh, whose footprint that actually was, is. Yeah, and, I mean, and how far away was he from you? This, this wolf was only a, only a matter of metres away, only a few metres away. And, um, you know, they, they say that this plaster takes 15 minutes to set, but actually, of course, it's an hour and a half. And um, yeah, we'd been filming at a fairly hectic, hectic pace. So I thought, well, I've got, five, you know, while it's setting, I'll, I'll rest my eyes. So I lay down in the sagebrush nearby and just had a little doze. And it was, it, was, it was like this time of year. So the sun just had that first warmth in it. And, um, and then I felt that there was a presence there. And I just very carefully looked up and, and poked my head over the top of the, the sagebrush. And there was the wolf looking at the plaster, thinking, what's going on? What's happening here? And um, I watched it for some time. It's not, very, it's not every day you get the drop on a wolf. And uh, eventually I couldn't contain myself anymore. I sort of smiled. And that was enough movement for the wolf to spot me. And we, we then had this Mexican standoff. We looked each other you know, directly into the eye and, and then the wolf left and was gone in a moment. It, it was, I've had a lot of encounters with wolves, but in some strange way, that was particularly special. I mean, even more poignant when you think that th that wolf uh, has, was taken off the endangered list that uh, Idaho is now allowed to shoot these animals. Because days, presumably that they take livestock, presumably because, as you say, they don't, people have this medieval fear of them. There's an there's a, a irrational hatred of the wolf. And um, the, four days after that, that, that encounter, this wolf lost protection. And the following year, I know that it was killed. So uh, it's very sad. But but the wolves are doing really well. And the thing is, they outwit the hunters. They're, 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 they've learned now that people are dangerous and they, 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 they squirrel themselves away in dark recesses. And there is a new status quo coming along as well between the hunters and the wolves. It takes time. Animals are, I think, in, in many ways, far more intelligent than we are. They, they understand things. It takes us much longer to understand our relationship with them than the other way around. When you say it takes time, isn't that the crux of the whole thing? Though? You, you've written lyrically about nature and how we're part of nature, but are we really part of nature? Haven't we really gone past being a part of all of this, that we, we, treat, we treat it so abominably, we spoil it, we shoot it, we, we do everything we can to make money out of it. And you know, you, your book is a eulogy to all of that, but I wonder whether really we've passed the point of saving so much of what we, uh, have, you know, what we, you and I have grown up with. I can understand, I can understand that sentiment, but I think that um, I'm encouraged though by the fact that nature has the ability to restore herself incredibly well. Uh, na nature can heal damage if, if she's given the opportunity and, and even faster with a helping hand. And I think we've all seen that to some extent in this last year of lockdown, when we look into the night skies over Britain, and now we can see more stars than we could 12 months ago, simply because of a reduction in pollution. So I think when you see that, you, you should also have faith that there are other restorative processes in the, in the environment taking place um, at the same time. Um, and, yet, and yet you see, uh, I would come back to Africa again, and and George Adamson's camp. I, I was in touch with um, Tony Fitzjohn, who used to help George Adamson. And I said, what's happening in Cora now? Because he's returned there. And he said, oh, there are no elephants. There are no, the, the rhinos were shot in the 70s. The elephants went in the 80s. And now it's just Somalian herdsmen with camels and goats uh, uh, supplying the Arabian market. Well, if you, if you lose these big beasts, what, what hope? You can't replace them. You can't replace them fast enough. No, I have great, I have great fears for the, the megafauna of the planet, and um, particularly rhinos. I have a very strong affinity with rhinoceros, and um, it's a terrible thought that within the, the, you know, the span of uh, uh, 
a human lifetime now, we could lose these species forever. And once they're gone, they cannot be brought back. And that would be a terrible indictment of humans' custodianship of uh, the planet over the last uh, few hundred years. Um, but I do think people want to do something about it, Selena. I think the problem is they don't know what to do. Yeah. I'm not sure I have the answer. Um, is it not think... buying certain goods from certain goods from certain countries? Yes. That, uh, I mean, for example, China was always known, wasn't it, as the one that wanted rhino horn for aphrodisiac purposes or whatever they used it for? This is true, but China has now delisted uh, rhino horn as a traditional medicine. And in fact, China, I've seen with my own eyes, China has taken on board the concepts of conservation and they're moving in a much more ecological direction with regards to these issues. Um, not just because as a nation, they don't want to be accused of, of of uh, abusing nature, but also because there's a groundswell amongst ordinary Chinese people for conservation. And that's largely as a result of the documentaries that David Attenborough has made. And that, that, that was really interesting to see. I, I was filming in China last year and they're just setting up their very first national park. Now that, that for me was fascinating because we think of national parks as having been there forever but they're actually a very new concept. And as we saw with, when, when Donald Trump was, was president, they're also still vulnerable. Um, so it's worth bearing in mind uh, that conservation, the efforts for conservation, the processes that we enshrine today are still in, in their infancy. And there's an awful lot of, of work still to be done to improve that process and to guard the successes that we, we have achieved. I, d I don't know what the answer is for the megafauna. I suspect that we have, yes, to stop people utilizing the resources. We have to pursue the poachers and enforce the law. Um, but also in some way, we need to reach out to, to the middlemen who um, control the trade and make them feel as endangered as the animals that they are endangering. Perhaps there could be reward schemes for Interpol, I don't know. But I, I don't think you can do just one thing we have to do everything all at the same time. Otherwise we will lose these animals and that would be a tragedy. You, uh, in your book, you talk about uh, using your senses. I, you know, I get the impression that you're not very impressed with most people who go out into the wild. Uh, and uh, and, and you, you, you feel that they're not engaging probably enough. They're not using the senses that we have been gifted with to really get in touch with nature. Uh, can you explain a little bit about why you feel that we can improve on our senses, on the you know, hearing and seeing and, and all these things, how we can train ourselves to use our senses more? The, the thing is we live in a world where we overstimulate our senses. So our music is loud and it's, uh, it's not subtle, it, it, it's raucous. Um, we bombard ourselves with bright colours uh, and, and a huge amount of visual stimulus. When we go shopping in a supermarket, you know, the special offers come in, day glow um, stars attached to them. And even on our roads, road signs are are displayed at a set height, at a set distance from a junction. This all makes sense because we want to be certain to see things. In nature, everything is far more subtle. And in fact, it's the reverse. Most things in, in the wild are trying to avoid being seen and, unless they're trying to attract a maze. And, um, <clears throat> but, but what's interesting is if you accept the fact that we are still ourselves wild creatures and that for um, more than 99% of our history as a species, we were hunters and gatherers, depending on our own sensory uh, perceptions. Uh, we have hardwired within ourselves the ability to see, smell, hear, touch, uh, and feel and intuit uh, to a much higher degree than, than we, we access on a daily basis. And it's, it's been my experience in teaching people to use these, these senses that they very quickly, we can all very quickly start to access these abilities. And as soon as we do, we, so, we see more and we're moved by more of what we see. And that improves our, our spiritual uh, connection to the environment around us. Are you not talking though about yourself? Uh, I, I mean, I, if I said to you, could you survive? If, if this 
COVID uh, pandemic had wiped out, you know, huge numbers of people. Well, it has to a great degree, but if we were forced to rely on nature and on our senses to survive, do you believe that you could survive? Yeah, you believe like, that if you were out I know, in the I know that I can, yeah. You would find enough to eat, you would, you would know how to do it, you would, all yeah, of that. I mean, that's been the work of my life, is to learn how to do these things. Um, but I would, but, but I would, But before you go into that, why, but why, but why was it, you, why has it been mm -hmm. your life's work to know I, that how to survive when something like this hits us? I don't know. It found me. I mean, why do, do any of us do what we do? Um, something reached out and said, touched me and said, this is what you should do. And, and I've just followed my heart. I, I read somewhere that you uh, had had an epiphany when you were a little boy going to a safari park yeah. and saw a rhino, was it, or a hippopotamus? It was long lead. It was long lead and in, in the 1960s. And in those days, you could get very close to the animals. And I remember it was a long journey. It was a hot day. And I was you know, tired of sitting in the back of the car. And we stopped. And, um, you know, I was, you know, there was the offer of a 99 flake to, pl to, pl to placate me. But I was actually enthralled by the rhino. I was watching. I remember watching a rhino thinking, this is amazing. What an incredible creature this is. And um, I've never forgotten that moment. And I, I feel it now still every time I see one in the wild. I still feel that connection to that first one that I saw. The other day, I was I went for a walk on my farm. I was just and, uh, in Yorkshire, and um, I I found something, and I was reading your book at the same time, and I thought I bet you would know. I bet you could survive with this. I'll show you. See what that is? Can you see? Hold on. I can't. I can't see. Is it oh, a polished axe? It's a polished axe. You've got a polished axe, a Neolithic axe. Yeah, look at that. It's It's been polished and honed to a very... You, you could survive with that, couldn't you? And it's been... And you can see it's been used. It looks to me like it has some wear on it as well. And yeah, that, that that's from the... the that, that, that would have been left by Britain's first farmers. That's it. And they, they polished the axes because they needed to fell the trees. If you don't polish the axe, they tend to break. By polishing them, they, they, it gives them re resilience. And um, of course, they were doing a lot of felling to create fields. Well, there you are. You see, I didn't know that. You've you've taught me another little lesson today. Oh, I always feel, I, I think that we all would love to, to go into nature, and and find plants and and eat things which are so good for us, but we don't know. I mean, mushrooms. We don't know anything about them really. Most of us haven't a clue what we should be eating unless we have someone with us who can show us what to, to eat. And you're an expert in that as well, I, I, I know. Well, I, 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 I eat wild food has been a big part of what I do. I, I would actually say my love for plants has been one of the most important means of communicating with other cultures around the world. Um, as soon as you take an interest in botany, um, you have a means to communicate with people who, who rely still on plants in other places. And they may be slightly different species, but the families are similar. And they often share um, properties or similarities in, in, in their, their uses, um, which is a great way to open up a door to conversations with other cultures, which is, for me, plants have been, a, a, my love for plants has really helped me. And so your diet now, if you were left to your own devices, what would you like to eat? What do you eat? In, in what way? I mean, I, I'm, I'm just like everybody else. I'm <laughs> I thought you'd go home and eat bark and and, and, cut, <laughs> and cut kind of resin and, and have a sip of tea at night time with perhaps a bit of chamomile in it and, and chill out, you know? <laughs> no, but, uh, but, uh, but last week I went out and, uh, and I drank some birch sap because this is the time of year when the sap flows in the birch. And for me, that's a, a little ritual uh, that I, I indulge in every year. Uh, it's almost a, an, an elixir after after the winter that makes you feel good. In a, in a, you, it just tastes like water, but it has some magic feeling in it, and uh, that was very special. There you are. Do you have any recommendations for putting on your face, making your skin, <laughs> making, your no, skin I, making your skin glow? This year, I've learned an important thing, and, and I'm going to invest in a much cheaper webcam. <laughs> <laughs> Very diplomatic, really. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
Well, I, I think that you you uh, harbour all kinds of uh, hidden potions which we could all really know all about or learn about and and deploy in some way or another. Now, I, I wanted to to ask you uh, because the book is full of practical information for a girl like me who spends most of her time outdoors. The binoculars, for example, how to get the best binoculars, what to look for with the numbers on the binoculars. That's been you know wonderful for someone like me, but also. Um, shoes, footwear, clothing, you, you, you cover all of it in the book. Why did you decide to do that now? What, what, what was the spur to make you put all this down, this very practical, useful information for anyone who wants to get outside and enjoy nature? Well, I, w I wanted to write about reconnecting ourselves with the, with the natural environment and discovering the wildness that's within us. But the strange thing is that um, I think lockdown gave me impetus as well. It felt important. I wanted to share what I've learned. And um, as you will have seen in the book, some of it is all about our senses and, um, and, and common sense approach to finding things as well. But equally, there are some small details that can really make a difference. Um, we don't need very much equipment to see nature or to engage with it. But the choices we make are important. And um, particularly having footwear that's quiet so that you, you, you can approach things uh, without making unnecessary noise. I think that's really important. So, yeah, I, I, think, I think it was, I felt a real impetus during lockdown to make sure I share this and that it's not lost. You know, I, think, I think the coronavirus has made us all feel a little mortal um, at this time. So, you know, I, I tried to do something practical about that. Yes, everyone's out walking around here. You know, so many people are enjoying breathing in fresh air and walking, but they're not really taking much in. You know, they often have their heads down, looking at where they're going, rather than looking around them and and and, and up into the skies. It seems as though that's that's the way they are. Do you do you find that that's a frustration for you? No, it's it's normal, and and it's easy. You only have to be preoccupied with something in your life, and all of a sudden, you become sensorily blind to what's going on around you. Um, but but there are lots of people who do see a lot of things. We have some very good spotters, bird watchers, naturalists who are extremely good at at seeing things. Um, and I just want to open, throw that door open to more people so that we, we can all learn to see more. I mean, I could have said a lot more. I could have gone into more detail in some areas, but I think there's detail enough. I think that, 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 that I just want to give enough that people can go out, enjoy and start to fill in the other gaps for themselves, because that's the magic. It's the magic is your own experience. But I, I, you, you teach people here how to walk. You teach people, yes. That, you know, there's a certain walk you can take, which is a stalking walk, a stealthy walk. You can creep up on, on all kinds of creatures if you know how to do it. So it's, it's that kind of practical information which we, is things, so useful. These things, are, we forget how important they are. And in, in many of the First Nations I've worked with who absolutely depend on their ability to hunt with very primitive weapons, their ability to get close to things and to notice things is, is absolutely vital. And these are things they school their children in. Um, so they become very, very expert. And it, it's very easy to miss that and not to understand that that's going on. Now, I, I always remember driving through the bush. We were filming with some Kalahari bushmen, uh, some San, uh, some uh, Johansi San. And um, we're driving on a, on a dirt track or maybe like 30 miles an hour. And all of a sudden there was a commotion in the back of the, uh, the four by four. And one of them had spotted the tail of a, of a lizard, which was a meal. And you know, how he saw that, you know, it's just staggering. Uh, this tiny, tiny movement, and then they're out of the car and chasing after it for for their for their food. You know, it's uh, amazing. And th and that taught you, and that gave you a kind of a spur, did it as well, to learn to to absorb that kind very, of thing. very yeah. much. So. It, it sets you. It's a role model. It sets you an example of what is possible. Once you understand that that, that more is possible, then you attempt to do this for yourself as well. Do you feel that in the last, say, twenty years, you have become better at everything that you have tried to teach yourself? Yeah, I think I have. I think um, 
I think also as you get older, you calm down and you become hopefully a little wiser about um, what you're doing. And you, you learn lessons and as you mature, you constantly reaffirm them. And there comes a point in life where you're very confident in what you can do. Um, but it also, you, you realize how short life is as well. Life is very short. I mean, if we're lucky, we get 80 summers. And of course this year, many people have had far fewer than that. And that's not many years to learn the flowers of the summer uh, or the sounds of the winter. So, you, you know, we all have to really get a shift on if we want to be better naturalists. It's, it's very hard to tell a young person that life is short, <laughs> isn't it? Right? Yep, yep, I was in that category too. <laughs> I'd like you to read an excerpt from your book, um, and I, I've, I've, cho I've chosen it because um, I, I felt when I read it that I was with Ray when he was walking through this particular part of the world. So, would you, have you got it there? And, I have. Uh, this was. Um, I, was I, was, I was in um, in Africa looking for um, leopards, tracking leopards, and um, here we go. Um, but search as we did, uh, little, little, sorry, here we go. Since that day, I've had many opportunities to track leopards in many different locations. My fascination and respect for this animal is without limit. I love watching them. And I think that of all the animals that I've trailed, it is the leopard that has the most perfect footprint of all. Following leopard trails has taken me into some quiet corners that I would never have otherwise found and it is some that I would rather have avoided. One young male leopard's trail led me up a very small and tightly enclosed dried stream bed. Either side of me, the vegetation was tall, thick golden grass with acacia thickets behind. The leopard was typically keeping close to the edge of the stream. The sun was already warming the sand, causing the faint, faint leopard tracks to lose their definition. Rounding a tight bend in the stream, there in the middle of the bed, on top of a mound of sand, I could see a deep foot impression. It looked fresh. Taking care to remain silent, I moved forward to check it out. It wasn't a leopard's track, but quite literally the largest lion track I have ever seen. What was worrying was that it was perfectly fresh and led across my path obliquely towards the bush over my right shoulder. That lion, was now somewhere behind me. Despite being armed with a suitable rifle for defense, my main source of protection is always early detection of a threat. That defense had already been breached. A flock of, a flock of laughing doves sped past just overhead. I could hear every wing beat massively magnified. I realized my senses were already in overdrive and I could feel sweat beating on my neck. I focused on maintaining a wide field of vision. Stress can cause perceptual narrowing, reducing our ability to detect nearby dangers that would otherwise be obvious. Moving ever so slowly, I made the rifle ready to meet an imminent attack and turned to face the possible threat. This was essential. If a charge comes, it requires split second responses. Action is quicker than reaction so there is little time to waste realigning position. I was acutely aware that a lion charge, that a lion can charge at more than 20 meters a second and estimated that the gully wasn't more than eight meters wide. I needed to keep my gaze upwards. My feet would now have to feel their way. As I headed back down the trail, my eyes were at ground level of the surrounding bush. I strained to see through the vegetation. Through a tiny hole, I spotted a flicking movement deep in the shadows beyond, and then again, another flick. I froze and studied the movement. At first, I thought it was a bird. Then my brain registered what it was. It was a tail tip, a lion's tail. The lion was lying down, rumped towards me, about 40 meters away. With each flick of its tail, I could now make out a perfect sight of its testicles poking out from behind its hindquarters. A comedic moment, perhaps under other circumstances. More carefully than ever, I retraced my footsteps down the stream, keeping my rifle up and at the ready 
maintaining my wide, wide field of vision in case the lion was not alone. I do not think that at any other time in my life I have ever moved more quietly than I did that day. But in a strange way, I was protected by the very leopard I'd been trailing. For like all leopards, it had exhibited a genius for choosing a quiet path, well concealed from sight. Retracing its route afforded me some of that protection. Oh, I've got goose pimples. You know, I mean, you're mad, of course. <laughs> it's mad. <laughs> Listen, I've got some lots of questions that have come in that have spurred on by that wonderful reading. Seb Harrison has, uh, wants to know, do you feel we must look to our past, Ray, and our past relationship with nature to ensure our future with the planet? Have a think about that. Well, I, think it was Churchill. I, I think it was Churchill who said, um, those who would understand the future should you know, pay greater attention to the past. And I think that is the case. Um, when you look at the statistic of human um, advancement, if you like, in terms of technology, um, in terms of population, there's been this exponential growth in the human population and our techn technological abilities. But at the same time, there's been a decline in species and um, uh, damage to our, our ecosystem. And at some point we need to wake up. And I think we are waking up um, to the fact that it's actually not about saving the planet it's about saving ourselves the planet really doesn't care whether we survive or not the, the dinosaurs came and went and so might we but if we um, are wise and we pay attention and learn from um, the past um, particularly if we look at the you know the, the the core samples from deep in glaciers which give us an indication of the pollution in the environment in the past um, I believe that, that we may discover that our unique ability as a species on the planet um, fits us for the role of caretaking for the environment, in which case we might find that we live more, more we, we can live more harmoniously with nature and more happily in the future. Okay, we've got, we've got um, something here, we've got, got lots of um, specific um, answers if, if, uh, about the beavers, for example. Hi, Ray, what are your thoughts on rewilding programs in the U UK, including the reintroduction of beavers or um, future suggested plans to reintroduce things like lynx or even wolves? We've talked about wolves. Thanks. I, th I, think, rewild I think rewilding is a very interesting concept and there's a, a lot to be said for it. I'm, I'm, I'm more pro than, than con. It's early days for rewilding. I think there, there's a, still a lot we don't understand, as is always the case. Um, in Argyll in Scotland, beavers were reintroduced in an absolute textbook reintroduction. There was very, very good uh, local consultation and the, the, the um, process of rewilding has been a, a great success. And the beavers have provided um, new ecosystems that we, we haven't seen since they were eradicated in the past. And that's created in, an increase in biodiversity and habitat for all sorts of creatures and plants. Um, when it comes to uh, reintroducing apex predators, um, we, we, we're going to need to be um, very, very careful how, how we go about this, because there have been other places where animals have been introduced without cons cons consultation by direct action. And this has caused um, upset for the local people and um, a hatred for the animal that has been reintroduced, which is totally counterproductive. And um, I would love to see some uh, uh, more apex predators in Britain. I think it would be amazing. However, I don't think we're ready to do that. We currently are not demonstrating our ability to live in harmony with golden eagles and hen harriers. And until we can find a way of doing so, where we can keep all the, the, the different parties happy, where we can find the, the medium, the, the middle ground where the, the common sense prevails, I don't think we're ready to make other um, more ambitious reintroductions just yet. Uh, how do you, um, tips for lighting fires, gathering wood. Paul Maxwell is, lives in Northern Ireland and he's enjoyed wild camping. Um, he tends to avoid damp weather, he says, but, but what are your best tips for finding dry wood? 
uh, don't oh. avoid the damp oh, weather. Hold on, hold on. <laughs> light, lighting, he asked about lighting wet wood. I mean, is there such a thing? Can you light wet wood? No, you need to find dry wood, and there's always dry wood. Um, but you have to find it. But I think avoiding the damp weather is, is, is the problem. You need to embrace the damp weather in your training and go out in the worst conditions, in the rain and in the dark, uh, without a torch, and to practice the various methods that exist for fire lighting. I've written extensively about until you can do that under those circumstances. So uh, let nature be your, your, your greatest teacher. And... Um, that's how I learned by literally going out in the worst conditions and not giving in and staying and suffering until I succeeded. And, and it's only in that way that you can really um, um, harden yourself to those conditions for the future. Uh, Tricky Hull um, has emailed uh, to say his wife passed away suddenly two years ago and he's far more than ever that being in nature is my go-to place for balance, reflection and personal survival. What feelings and emotions do you get from being in nature? Um, I, I would say all of the same. All of, all, I would agree entirely with that, I think. Na nature is, for me, it's, it's my credo, I guess. It, I find um, wisdom and truth and there's no prejudice in nature. Nature just is, and it's a very good good place to go and reflect on uh, decisions and the world and everything. Do I find, uh, just digressing, I find that uh, nature is so cruel. I everything eats everything else. Yeah, no, I know. If, if I go out, you know, every day I find a poor little thing that's yeah. been eaten, dead. I, d I don't see it. I don't think nature is cruel at all. Um, I think that... Um, nature just is and creatures on a daily basis have to demonstrate their right to survive and um and i think that you know life is not without risk we try very hard to remove risk and um i mean i think you can see that in europe recently with um scientists being afraid of the astrazeneca virus uh, vaccine when actually the the risk of a problem was so minuscule compared to the problem that we're facing um, perhaps they'd lost sight of the fact that no, that you can't live without risk. And it's accepting that and embracing it and acting within natural forces that's important. Um, Jim uh, has said, evening, really fantastic talk, love the book. Question besides the elephant, what's the strangest thing you sent tracked? Strange thing I've sent tracked? Mm, that's a very good, that's a very good question. Um, I never actually found it. There was something I followed for um, half a day in a rainforest and I could smell it in the trees above me, but I never got to see what it was. And it had a strange uh, odor that was slightly, su slightly sweet, um, but, it, it, but, um, but also very animal. It, it wasn't uh, bats and it wasn't uh, flowers that attract bats. Uh, it was definitely a creature that was moving in the canopy, but I never saw it. But it, it was, I think it was following me. Um, it, it made it out of curiosity. I've got a, a question here, which um, is all about scouts and uh, British girl scouts. Uh, it's, it's from Nan, Nanarism. Well, th this is an email address, so I haven't got her name. A few years ago, friends in the British Boy Scouts, British Girl Scouts, enjoyed a weekend with you. On behalf of Scouts Everywhere, I'd like to thank you for your contribution to the outdoor education, comfort and inspiration to Scouts around the globe. Would you consider a relaxing thank you weekend canoe exhibition expedition in the US with some local Scouts? And also what's next for your favorite, what's next for our favorite adventure mentor? So there you are. <laughs> Well, thank you. Several, would you consider a thank you weekend canoe ex expedition in the US with some local <laughs> scouts? Number one. And then what's your next adventure? Well, I definitely consider it. It's just obviously the, the problem is usually time. So um, I, 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 I love working with scouts. I think they're it's the most amazing organization and very underestimated. And, and I also like the concept of scouting. And I hope that people who read the book will go out and become nature scouts, looking, looking out and looking out, looking out for the welfare of our wildlife. Um, what's next for me? 
Um, I'm writing some more at the moment. I've got two other little projects I'm working on, which you'll have to wait and see. Um, and I'm very much enjoying uh, writing. Um, and then, then it'll be back to teaching this year. So uh, that's great. And then I should have been on a lecture tour at the moment, Selena. We had to cancel that because of COVID. I know a lot of people were very disappointed, but the good news is we are going to take that out on the road from February next year. So uh, you can look out for that. And that'll be at theatres all around the country. My goodness, your energy levels must be, you know, stratospheric if you do all of that. Let me say that. I, I actually really like, I cherish those opportunities because when you work in television, you talk to a lens. When you're on tour, you're talking directly to people and it's much, it's much, it's wonderful. You've um, a question here about your favourite book about nature. Uh, you, you, in your, in your, in your um, thanks at the back of the book, you mentioned Jane Goodall, of course, but uh, what is your favourite book? I think my, fav my favourite book on, on nature actually is written by a hunter. And, um, and that's, uh, it's Jim Corbett writing about uh, the man-eating uh, leopard of Rudra Prag. I think it's one of the greatest books written by a naturalist. And um, I, I think a lot of naturalists uh, fall shy of him because he was a hunter, but of course he helped to save the tiger. And he played, you know, there's, there's Jim Corbett National Park today because of him. And his writing, and his, if you're a naturalist and a tracker, the detail that's in his books is, is the veracity is just amazing. And uh, they're wonderful reads. Someone who's just 15, Said, wants to know what your opinion on Manic Moorlands is. He, he says, I presume it's a boy. I'm 15 and your work inspires me massively. Yes, he's called Jack Gaskell. There you are. Hey, Jack. Yes, Jack, who's 15. Well, these, I'm no expert on Manic Moorland, but I know that um, one of the things that's really interesting about Manic Moorland is this conflict between uh, grouse shooting and hen harriers and um, I think we have to remember that the hen harriers uh, are there because the moor is managed and uh, provides an opportunity for them. We've got so many questions uh, to ask you I mean it just goes on and on. Um, uh, what other current day nat naturists do you admire well and recommend we listen to? Uh, who, would, who else would you recommend we listen to? Rodman. I tell you how I really like uh, the work of. I, I really, I, I really like um, the work of Simon King. I, I'd like to see him back on on television. That would be really good. He's an extremely good naturalist, um, and uh, with many many uh, good wildlife presenters, and. Um, yeah, I think everyone makes their contribution and I, and I think that's good. We need lots of different opinions and, and diversity because no one person has the answers when it comes to nature. And um, so I, I, as, I, we need as many as possible, I would say. Here's a good one for you. What do you do when an elephant charges? This is um, <laughs> <laughs> some, some, <laughs> Mr. McKenzie, I, I teach travel safety. And this is a question I found difficult to answer. <laughs> There you it's go. a very difficult question to answer. Well, I can tell you what Kalahari Bushmen do. They tend to um, laugh at elephants and talk to them. And, um, <laughs> and they bang pots together to keep them from coming through their villages. But the real danger, of course, is an elephant in must. The thing about an elephant, you need to be out of sight and downwind of it. And that, that's the key thing, is you need to act swiftly to get out of the way. Um, you can't climb a tree because they can pull you out of the tree or they can push the tree over. The most important thing is to maintain distance. If you're actually in, a, in the situation where you are really being charged, um, you may have to stand your ground. But there's a difference between a mock charge, as I'm sure you know, Celine, and, and a real charge. And the real charge comes with ears back and head down. But in the book, I've, I've put in a lot of detail of signs body language signs particularly for the elephant that you can read and that there's one thing one sign of stress that is often forgotten to mention and that's when they, they put a crease across their ears that makes the ears look like one of those headdresses that uh, the egyptians used the pharaohs would wear and it's a very subtle sign and of course most people confronted with an elephant 
are not looking at these details, but it's these little signals that the elephant's giving to say, I am massively stressed by your presence. And if you spot that soon enough, then you can back off and give some space. That's the key thing. And if you want to know the, all the, about must, you should read Ray's book. It's a, the best description I've ever read about uh, a, an elephant in must, uh, the signs and the smell and the everything else. Uh, is it, is, it a, is it an elephant? No, it isn't. It's a cat, isn't it? A, a big cat. You have to narrow your eyes because you, you don't want your eyes to, to shine when you're faced with something yeah, leopard, like le leopards. A leopard. Yeah, le leopards don't like eye contact. Leopard, leopard may attack you if you make strong eye contact with it. And yeah. I love leopards. They're the most amazing animals. If you've ever been close to a, to a leopard, you never forget it. That it's, it's like being next to a, a power station, a substation. You can feel the energy of the animal pulsing from up without it. It's, it's really something. And where was that? You've seen various leopards. You've seen snow leopards in China. But which uh, leopard well, do I mean, you remember most? I'm talking about the well, the common no, that's the common leopard. The snow leopard, I haven't been close enough to to, to tell you. I saw snow leopards last year, which was amazing, and they're they're close more closely related to tigers than to than to to leopards. I've never seen better camouflage on any creature. If you literally, if you take your eye off of it for a second, you can't see it again. It's just astonishing. I think a lot of people feel, don't they, Wonderful. that if they're confronted with a wild animal, it's always going to come for them. It's always going to grab them. So it's going to kill them. And, and your book says firmly yeah, right no. way through, that's not it at all. That's never it, unless there's something else going no, on. No, and it, it's very unusual. There are only a few animals that would come to get you. Um, you know, most things attack because you've got in the way. You've misread the indications, the signs that they're giving out, um, or you've, you, you've come between their food or, or their young. Um, and you may well have done that unwittingly, but most, mostly animals really want to, to give you a distance and they give us warning as well, mo in most cases, not always. But. What is your favorite wild place? I'm not going to tell you because if I do, then it may cease to be wild, but um, I have favorite wild places. Is it, tell us which continent? Well, I've got favorite places on many continents, unfortunately, but I, I really like large forests. So the boreal forest means a lot to me. It's the largest plant of forest on the planet. And when I'm there, I feel totally insignificant that I, I, I feel like it's one organism rather than many. And it's the intactness and the scale of that, that landscape that makes it so special. And uh, it, it gives me the opportunity to reflect of, of what we've lost in other places too. Uh, Jason has, uh, wants to know, I know a number of South African rangers uh, and they suggest that the only way to preserve the rhino is to allow people to hunt it, to give it a value and therefore an incentive for landowners to have them, protect them. Is this a view? you align to, or would you prefer an alternative option? I, I, don't, I don't feel that we need to hunt rhinoceros um, to give them a value. Um, the, the, the rhino is a different problem to the elephant. If you, to collect ivory, the ele elephant must be killed, but rhinoceros, the, in many places, the horns have been cut off to devalue them so that uh, they have no value to the poacher. And there is a, um, a suggestion that that horn could be sold as diamonds are in a regulated way into the black market so that there's no black market. The big problem is, one of the problems that rhinos have encountered is since there's been a, a total prohibition of trade in rhino horn, the value on the black market for the horn has massively uh, increased and directly related to that, the, the, the poaching has increased as well. So it would seem that while we try to suggest to people in other places that perhaps it would be better to find alternatives to using rhino horn for dagger handles or for medicine, um, it may be that we can um, manage the demand that it does exist regardless of our wishes uh, by controlling a trade in the horn. And I think there's great sense in that. Um, but it's absolutely true that wildlife will only survive into the future if it has a financial value. And we need to embrace that right now, straight away, 
and work to find a, a way. Because you know, if you're if you're a, a farmer in Africa and you're living very close to the breadline, and an elephant comes into your fields, your children go hungry. Um, so you have to find a way for that farmer to benefit from the presence of of the elephants. And interestingly, I saw projects in China. Um, where elephants are protected and compensation is paid to farmers who lose their crops. So there are ways these things can be done and we need to, we need to look to those solutions and embrace them. But isn't that a bit of a cop-up for these African dictators or even leaders in African nations who are looking for money and they say, right, well, if you give us the money, you know, we will protect the elephant. And then there becomes this kind of black market economy anyway going on. It's the, it's the corruption, isn't it? So, you know, that is too big an issue for us to discuss. <laughs> Just a cop out. <laughs> <laughs> I have very strong opinions on that. But yeah. at the end of the day, we have to be hopeful. And um, some of the very, very best conservationists I've encountered are, of course, local conservationists from uh, small communities who are being funded, paid and trained as rangers. And I've also had the opportunity to, to interview members of the Kenyan Wildlife Service who themselves had been poachers. And uh, I always remember talking to one of these men and him telling me that his family was so proud of him that he was now wearing a Kenyan Wildlife Service uniform and not a poacher. And I think we should have faith in that. That's a nice story. Tim Winwood, uh, if you could be any animal in nature other than a human, what would you want to be? Oh, that's a very, very good question. Um, I think I think a leopard. I think it's uh, it, it's good at telling the world not to mess with it. And they do do very well. Um, it's either that or, or something so small that I could disappear and hide from humanity. <laughs> I don't you wouldn't know. want to be a pangolin, would you? I wouldn't want to be a pangolin, sadly. No. no Marcus. What's Mark happening to the pangolin is just appalling. And again, these, these animals are being killed for their scales and for their flesh in huge numbers. They're the most docile of creatures. They're a wonderful thing to see in the wild. And it breaks my heart that, that there are stupid humans who would see the demise of this creature. Actually, Mark has, Mark Betty's um, emailed in to say, it's, you know, talking about the pangolin, because the pangolin, of course, uh, has been implicated in the COVID pandemic, uh, the use of pushing these little creatures in with other creatures mm -hmm. in the markets. What has the COVID pandemic taught you about the human race? And what lessons have you specifically learned <laughs> during lockdown? Well, I mean, that's really interesting. That's really, that's really interesting. It would be very quick. I could very quickly find some negatives. I could, I could point my finger at very poor leadership or all sorts of things, but I'm not going to. I think what I've learned from COVID is that within a year of going in lockdown, we can develop a vaccine and roll it out to nearly half of the population of the United Kingdom. You know, there's 68 million people in Britain. That's an achievement. I mean, that's amazing. And it just shows you that when we decide that something is important and we put the funding behind it, we can solve problems. We have incredible brains. And when the political will is motivated, we can achieve anything. And that makes me think that there is the possibility in the future that we can fix the environment too. And Mark has one, that's the follow up question that Mark has predicted with this. If you were the prime minister for the day, what would you change to allow us to reconnect and protect nature? I, I'm not sure. I'd have to give long thought to that. That's not an easy, I don't think that's a question you can answer off the cuff. Um, prime ministers have, have to balance a lot of uh, different issues. What I would say, though, is I think I, 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 I wish that our politicians saw in problems opportunities. Because to me, that's what makes a good leader. A good leader sees a problem and, and sees in it an opportunity to make something better. And, and that's, I think, the key thing. A, a good leader looks at a problem and sees the opportunity to improve things. Would you like to see more national parks, for example, in Britain? No, I think I, I think we've got uh, national land. parks. Uh, national parks aren't the whole solution. We also have a remarkable um, areas of outstanding national beauty. What I think we could do is 
work harder at connecting uh, the green spaces in the country so we could increase our corridor uh, corridors between reserves. There have been some great work in, in East Anglia connecting different uh, um, nature reserves there, uh, creating these wildlife corridors. These, these small things, which we could achieve quite cheaply, have a, a, a large uh, um, effect for the benefit of uh, of wildlife and, and biodiversity. The, the most important thing of all, I think, that I've learned about nature is ev biodiversity is everything. And um, each of us in our own way, in our gardens or whatever, can help to increase biodiversity by increasing habitat opportunities for wildlife. And in so doing, not only in, in, enrich our experience of nature, but also ensure our own survival into the future. It's uh... It's salutary, salutary to think that uh, we produced a man of the stature of John Muir, for example, who was born in Dunbar and, like you, used to go off into the hills. He went into the Lammermuir Hills and went off to America and established one of the largest parks, one of the largest areas of wilderness for the American people. Uh, you know, the gift that John Muir gave the Americans was uh, you know, unfathomable, actually. And yet in this country, the Lammermuirs are covered in windmills and uh, uh, they're not valued. They're not valued as they should be valued. And we seem to be like this. We all seem to be on the back foot when it comes to nature and protecting species in this, in, in the, on this island. Do you not feel that we have over these years wiped out through, through just not thinking about it, wiped out? A whole ecosystem, which we we could have protected. I think, I, th I think there are a lot of things you, you could say like that. But at the same time, I feel that there is a change in the NR, and um, I think ecolo ecological issues are no longer window dressing for politicians. The, the, it, it, it affects not just votes, but the ecological problems that we are experiencing have a financial impact on humanity as well. It would help if your little book <laughs> was given to every child in school as a, a, a manual, you know, because it's all there for them. Uh, and I think it would inspire uh, and help another generation who, you know, we need to hand the baton on, don't we? Is that, that's the most important thing at the moment. We need to, we need to hand right. the baton on, but I don't want us to... Have... Sorry, go ahead. No, I can't. You're, you're, breaking, you're breaking up. You're slightly... You're doing your number again. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> You're breaking up. I, 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 don't, I don't think we should be handing the bill to the next generation. They seem to be being handed a lot of woes and negativity. And the key thing is we need to accept that humanity has made a lot of mistakes. But we do learn from mistakes. And um, I think there is the opportunity for us to learn from, them, from the mistakes of the past, to shape a better world in the future. And to me, the key thing is not to look at the woes, but to look at the potential good that we can do. And I think that the lockdown has really shown us that. I think people have come out of their uh, houses, they're in, 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 particularly in, in our urban areas, and they've gone to green spaces. And they, as you said earlier, they they breathed in, they've drunk in the fresh air in those places and been moved by it emotionally moved by it and this is the key thing we need to look to the advantages of improving our environment our ecosystem our involvement with nature uh, and 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 move towards uh you know uh, it, th there is a potential natural nirvana ahead of us if we reach for it but we need to have skills don't we we need to have the skills to do it i, I have a little farm and i uh, I, I'm in a, a higher level scheme and I do my little best to, to bring nature back to the way it, it used to be, say, 20 or 30 years ago. We've got otters here now. But I find that when I reach out to ask anyone for help, the skills aren't there, which is why I feel that, you know, your book, which lays out those skills so um, simply in many ways, uh, you know, is a, a vital handbook. And uh, yeah. I suppose on that note, Ray, I, I, I hope you will go around the schools and hand them out to school children because it is a, 
It is an excellent manual to teach children how to touch, smell, hear, intuit, and then go out and explore the natural world. Thank you very much. A massive thank you to Ray and Selena for that discussion and thanks to all of you at home for watching. This event was presented in partnership with Penguin Live and you'll find a link below the video to sign up to their newsletter. This was also part of our nature season so if you enjoyed this event please do have a look on our website um, to find more events like this. And finally if you do want to buy a copy of Ray's book please remember there's a link in the menu above. Thanks again for watching and uh, good night from the British Library.